You know, I really thought the laundry episode was going to be the peak of our esoteric topics last semester. We really need to stop checking the uh, random article button on Wikipedia. I'm Grayson. I'm Ezra. And as much as I hate to say this, welcome to the bug episode of Are We Doing This Right on WEGL 91.1 Auburn. All right. So we're going to be talking about bugs, uh, literal and figurative, but, you know, first literal. Yeah, let's start with literal, Ezra. Okay. Come on. So uh, as, as mentioned in our intro, uh, last week I hit the random Wikipedia article button and I got moths four separate times. <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit about moths. Are you ready? Buckle no, your seats. I'm absolutely not ready. Why have you done this to me? All right. So uh, first off, some, some moth 101 knowledge real quick. So as expected, moths are close relatives of the butterfly. I mean, that's kind of a given. They're like, they look like emo butterflies. Um, you but can't call them emo butterflies. Like, mm. They look like emo butterflies. But anyway, so apparently they both start out as caterpillars. I didn't know that. Um, and, you know, they, it's, this, it's the same process. But the, the difference is moths, especially as larvae, they eat fabric. While, uh, or at least they prefer to eat fabric. While obviously, like normal butterflies, they eat like leaves and stuff. Is there something special about fabric? Um, I don't really know. Actually, I think it's like just I don't like their bodies are they can digest it. Like if a butterfly tried to eat fabric, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be able to. But like moths can. They're like more vicious. <laughs> anyway, um, something I didn't know is like. Historically speaking, moths actually preceded butterflies. Really? So I guess it wouldn't be right to call moths emo butterflies, but butterflies like super cheery moths. Um, so like you say historically, like how long? Um, like like they've been around for a long time. But, you know, as flowers were starting to, like it's kind of believed that flowers and butterflies, moths, bees, all of those kind of developed around the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, you had bees and moths a long time before you had butterflies. And the, so that's what kind of led to just flowers being everywhere. Uh, the original pollination process of that was with moths. Right, right. Um, some other strange moth facts. The largest moth in the world is almost a foot wide, which is just absolutely terrifying to think about. Yeah, that's, I mean, for any size bug, that's just too big. It's huge. Um, and, and even today in some ecosystems, they're the only pollinator in some places you don't have bees or butterflies or anything else. You just have moths. <laughs> um, something else that I thought was cool. There is this species of moth that actually, so the, a predator of moths are bats, right? Right. Um, they attack most insects. Well, there's this type of moth that, um, it can produce the same clicking sound as bats, bats do for echolocation. No way, really? Yeah, so the bats have no idea where they are because the moths make the same clicking and it just completely throws them off guard. Wow, I would have never real like, that's, that, that's beyond what you would think normal for bugs. I mean, that's, yeah. that's a big evolution. It's next level. The idea of a clicking moth kind of terrifies me. It's right. Like, like loud echolocation clicks. That's just but, like the one thing I don't want to hear walking through the woods at night. Exactly. Um... Something else that's kind of just weird. Uh, all of these these strange moths are pretty much from Africa and like parts of Asia. The you know the clicking moth, uh, the moths being the only pollinator. And some parts of Africa, moth larvae are like the crucial food source. Like that's right. Be, they're they're so dense in protein. Um, and our last bizarre moth fact: uh, the term moth actually comes from the old English word for maggot because moths were like that's the first time people discovered moths was like the larvae eating clothes. Oh, and oh they eventually is that what those realized. larvae are? Or just they they thought they were maggots. They thought they were. The, well, I guess, I mean, maggot is kind of like a broad term. It doesn't necessarily refer to like one specific type of bug. Right. So it, most larvae, but yeah, you know, it, they didn't draw the parallel between them and caterpillars until much later. So uh, the pressing moth question that I'm sure has been on everyone's mind, and that is why are they attracted to light? Like, you know, you go outside at night and there's like 45 moths swarming around a street lamp. Mm -hmm. um, so the reason why is because moths naturally try to like keep a constant angular relationship to the moon at night. 
and basically that means they're trying they're constantly checking their location rel and their their rotation relative to the moon and the moon's pretty far away so right. when the moth moves like 100 meters forward the moon its position doesn't change at all relative to the moth um but if something's any closer than that well when the moth moves relative to the moth uh a lamp that's only a few meters away it moves a lot Right. And so the moth panics and it tries to uh, compensate for that by, again, like moving relative to the light. But the light's moving so fast relative to the moth that it spirals uh, over and over until it hits the lamp. And it's like it's basically the result of an instinct that they can't control. Right. right. So even though the moth is aware that it shouldn't be uh, running into the lamp over and over again, it's the only way it knows to like get around. So we've effectively, with every source of like outdoor artificial light, have created a moth anxiety party. Like, yeah, it's really sad to think about. <laughs> I always thought they liked the light, but it's more like they just can't leave. That's that's yeah, that is much more sad. Yeah, um, uh. and apparently, due to like just the abundance of artificial light, there are a lot of places where moth populations are at like an all time low because they just don't really know where to go. They see the big lights. Right. Wow. Yeah. I'd never even thought about that from like a, an ecological perspective, what kind of damage that could be doing. Me neither. As far as light pollution goes. I didn't really think they were important until the, the whole like ecosystem thing about them being crucial for pollination. Right. Um, something else apparently. So historically, again, speaking, uh, moths are some of the most influential bugs, period. And the reason behind that, uh, it's the silk moth. So, oh, oh, I didn't realize those were moths. Silk comes from moths huh. entirely. Wow. Yeah. Are, is that like when they're larvae or when they're adults? Yeah, the when they're larvae and they're it's really their cocoon. Oh. When um you're harvesting silk, you're harvesting the uh moth cocoon. Um okay. so that's been around for a while. They were one of the first bugs. I think they may even be the first bug to be domesticated. There, I didn't really think about domesticating bugs other than like bees. But um, five thousand years ago in China, they they kind of like practiced this idea of uh, domesticating silkworms, and they bred a branch of silkworm that can't fly when they're adults. Oh, okay. So they're moths, but they can't fly, which makes them like they can they can sort of like I don't know. It's kind of like when you imagine a chicken flying, like they can, mm -hmm. but only like a foot. Uh, it's more like that. Like the moths can kind of glide and like fly around, but they, they can't. Hop. Yeah, they they can hop. They have hops. Um, Who would have thought we made the uh, you know the pugs of the moth world? Yeah, poor things. Yeah. <laughs> so when they they make like the larvae, they eat mulberries until they're ready to go into a cocoon, and then they go into a cocoon, and then uh, to harvest the silk, you boil the cocoon with the moth still in it. Right. Because oh. when the moth tries to leave the cocoon. Um, the, the it, it like spits this uh this sort of like enzyme at it and it melts the cocoon mm -hmm. and that's not good for business right you know you want silk yeah. string not clumps so they would actually uh eat the boiled moth removed from the silk after they finished boiling the cocoon i mean yeah that makes sense it's efficient yeah <laughs> um and of course silk is known for being very fine because it's like this thing that's weaved that you know, human hands couldn't really do. We're not as tiny as silk moths. Right, exactly. It was a finer thread than anything else available that was like cotton or wool based. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, very much so. And apparently, like, I was also astounded at the sheer number of cocoons that you'd need. I'm not really sure how they decided that they were going to start making like fabric out of this because you need 2,000 moth cocoons to make one pound of silk. Whoa, really? Yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, of course, as we all know, the silk ro uh, the silk worm led to the Silk Road, the massive uh, like trading network out of China, mm -hmm. and that just is one of the most important, crucial historical things for that entire country. And that wouldn't have happened without moths. Right. The you know the whole early modern world was built on trade, and that was the kind of big genesis of international trade. Yeah. Exactly. Something else I didn't know is uh, even today, moths, like hobbyist moth breeding is very much a thing. Um, in China, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Iran, it's really common for children to trade uh, like eggs, like moth eggs, mm -hmm. and like breed them and like collect them. 
they're they're just common like household pets for wow. young people. I guess like are. sea monkeys, that kind of vein. That makes sense. Yeah. It seemed weird at first, but yeah, I, I get it now. The one last uh, major use for, for moths. So because of China's history in the silk industry, as uh, sp- like long-term space travel has become more of a discussion uh, internationally, you know, we need a way, we, you need a sustainable food source. You can only pack so much food. Well, because you can eat silkworms, uh, silk moths, they their, their cocoon is edible, the moth itself is edible, the larvae is edible. Uh, apparently you can make a jam from the silk. Yeah. So (laughs) they're one of the, it's, it's, uh, proposed that for space travel, you breed a bunch of silkworms and then cook them as necessary. I can't remember if this was a a proposed program or if it actually made it to orbit or not, but I, I remember something about them either trying to grow those bugs or like harvest something like that on orbit, like as a, uh, a long-term experiment on the ISS. Yeah. But I can't remember if they actually, uh, got through with it or not. I believe it's, uh, for the most part, it's been proven successful. There's just not really a need for it right now. Right. Um, they naturally produce like compost immediately. So it, it, you can create an ecosystem where the only real like animal is the silk moth and some crops. So, right. All right, so what are we to be talking about next? All right, when we come back, the truths behind spy bugs. Welcome back to Are We Doing This Right on WEGL 91.1 Auburn. All right. Okay, so I I want to set this out and just claim that this show was your idea, and I refuse to talk about actual bugs. So so now we're going to be doing spy devices. All right. Um, I want to really, I want to start off with one of the earliest wireless bugs that we know of, and keyword that we know of. And this thing is referred to in the literature and the investigation of the time just as the thing, if that tells you how like unknown it was. Interesting. Right. So this thing was uh, found in the American embassy in Moscow in 1945. And what it was was a gift that had been given to the ambassador and it was hanging in his office, and it was a wood carving of the seal of the United States of America. And behind it, they just found a few simple components that they really didn't know what they were at the time. The big problem was it wasn't um, found for almost seven years to be a bug. Like it was just sitting there completely unknown. And what they were baffled by was that there was no way for it to plug in. There were no batteries. There were no active components in it at all. As far as it looked, it was just a couple pieces of metal and an antenna sitting inside of a wooden cavity. I'm wondering what even prompted them to examine it further later, like if they didn't, if they weren't aware of any other bugs at the time. That's the really cool thing about it. Um, the only way they actually found it was that a person working at the British Embassy nearby accidentally tuned into it on their radio. So they accidentally found it on like a car radio or on some sort of receiver. And they realized that they were hearing conversations from inside the American embassy. Oh, so it acted. That makes sense. Right. So this is a an extremely low tech um, transmitter, basically. It's yeah. kind of a mix between AM and FM. And the only way it worked was that the Soviet agents from outside had to point a radio transmitter at it and send power to it in order for it to transmit backwards. It's actually, you can almost think of it like a processor of modern RFID tech. Yeah. So if you've ever accidentally stolen something from a store and, um, you know, you walk out, the only way that they're detecting that is they're the, those small stickers on the bottoms of packages. Oh. The entire way that those work is that the detectors have to send out a constant radio, uh, a radio signal that powers up the chip on board that then transmits things back. And that was what was so, like, just scary about this was that something so simple and requiring no power could be hidden that easily and not suspected at the time. There was no maintenance or anything necessary on it. It's just some metal. Right. And it was just a Trojan horse. It was just seen as a gift. And even at 1945, our relations with the USSR weren't that great. We were definitely, at most, wartime allies. But still, the fact that this wasn't even questioned for seven years is remarkable it makes sense to me that if that was the first or one of the first uh bugs hidden that there was no reason to be suspicious right because and you know 
anything beyond that, I mean, the radios at the time were huge. It would be incredibly hard to pull this off. Yeah. That's what was so interesting about how simple this was. And this was by no means a precision transmitter. I mean, it splattered all up and down the frequency spectrum. It was low Very power. Rough. It was noisy. It was rough, but it was enough. Yeah. It was actually uh, invented by a, a Russian man named Leon Theremin, and you probably recognize his last name. The so Theremin? Yeah, the inventor of the instrument that's basically two antennas stuck together, and you know it's the sound of every old sci-fi film. You think of that. That's what a theremin is. That was the guy who <laughs> developed this entire thing. He was working for Russian intelligence, and it makes sense. He's a brilliant electrical engineer who developed this incredibly simple system. Yeah. This kind of system is actually called an illumination device by the NSA. They're still kind of in use, or they were in use for a long time of similar things. Um, after realizing what was there, the Americans actually reverse engineered the technology with the help of some British firms and started employing it in their own devices. I believe it was called the Easy Chair program. Interesting. But these were used um, just to spy on many, many embassies, but just that very, very simple technology was the very start of it. Yeah. It was even a point, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the U-2 incident. It was a, uh, a problem in 1960 where an American spy plane, a, a U-2, very, very high altitude, uh, crashed in the Soviet Union. And as part of the negotiations for the return of the pilot, that was actually brought up as a talking point that, hey, you know, we've never had good relations with spying on each other, that kind of thing. Yeah, because we had proof at that point that mm -hmm. they had spied on us. And it was very much a trying to paint the other as the, uh, the unjustified aggressor in this kind of trying to avoid a conflict. Yeah. This is actually kind of segueing in what I wanted to talk about with the, uh, how we detect these kinds of radio bugs. Now, when I talk about this, it's going to seem really like, basically, it seems like we should be listened to every second of every day by these kinds of remote bugs. Yeah. But these are actually a very uncommon threat. Um, beyond government where they're less common because of the tight security, they're much more of a, uh, a concern in like industrial espionage. Yeah. But even then, it, it's something that requires physical access and retrieving the thing. It's just uncommon. So um, a lot of the steps I'm going to talk about here won't even be gone through most of the time. They're not a big deal. So because most of these detectors rely on radio frequency, the easiest way is to use a radio detector. Yeah, if there's a radio frequency coming from somewhere that you don't expect, then mm -hmm. you can kind of figure out where the bug is. And these can also be incredibly crude depending on how much you're paying for them. I think the, I looked on Amazon last night and I think the cheapest one I found was like 12 bucks. That's and you insane. can go all the way up to, for example, a spectrum analyzer that can sweep tens of gigahertz in a few seconds. And that would be tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. And so most of these would only be owned by like, anti-espionage firms, again, why they're um, not a very common threat. I mean, $10,000 is not bad for security. Right, but it's incredibly niche. Maybe you need it, maybe you don't, security. And these are... That's true. Especially in the portable form factor that you would need to sweep a room, these are hard-to-find tools. There are even companies that make, again, tens of thousands of dollars tools that can detect even switched-off microchip devices. So it's basically... It's like a metal detector, but it finds transistors instead of metal. That's really interesting. Yeah, but again, it's tens of thousands of dollars for very, very niche equipment. Of course. So most of that only exists in like very, very high level or very high stakes situations. And the real problem of these is that bugs have gotten more advanced over time. They're not just the crude, you can accidentally pick them up on the radio ones of the past. I'm sure. So... I mean, these range all the way down to, at the very lowest level, the, think like the FM transmitter that you'd use in a car before aux ports were a thing. So it's just a small, low power FM device. Yeah. Uh, to the mid range where it's like a, uh, effectively a cell phone that's listening in and transmitting the audio outwards, either by data or by just like a call. And increasingly things that are leveraging like Wi-Fi and the internet to more modern in. devices. Yeah. Uh, we've even had bugs in recent Apple software where you could initiate a FaceTime call without the person who's getting called having to pick up. I remember that. Yeah, this was actually, that one's a really big uh, target of lawsuits right now because of people who with confidentiality agreements and Apple could have 
accidentally caused those confidentiality agreements to be breached yeah and things of that nature which is rough so again these detection methods are getting less and less and less effective as bugs get more and more uh more and more complicated and more and more advanced. It's harder for those things, those simple detectors to work at all or just be distinguished from all the other wireless traffic going around you every second of That's every day. That's what I was thinking. If everyone has uh, cell phones and stuff like that constantly sending and receiving data, then something in the corner of a room that's sending or receiving data uh, is both harder to notice, but also it has to compete with all that other stuff. Absolutely. A big process of the detection is turning off every single thing that you can, but with everybody having a phone and with the radio landscape as dense it is, as it is in like any sort of modern office, it's hard to do. You also have things like the old style bugs don't work because, well, they don't work through steel and concrete walls. They're oh, not going right. to work. So if you're in an interior conference room, oh, guess your bug doesn't work. Guess you're going to have to resort to Wi-Fi, which you're not going to be able to tell the difference from. Interesting. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to cover is not technically a bug, but it's still very, very cool and was, again, <laughs> invented by the USSR. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever watched, like, a spy film or maybe, like, some sort of crime drama like CSI, NCIS, that kind of thing? Yeah. Where they aim a laser at a window and then that's picking stuff up as a microphone? Oh, does that exist? Well, that's the whole thing. I thought these were just an invention of spy fiction and, like, you know, CSI zoom enhance. You know, yeah. I'm going to hack the mainframe type thing. Yeah. But it turns out, guess who invented these? Your boy, Leon Theremin. Of course. Yeah, so his wasn't technically a laser. It was because lasers hadn't been invented yet. This is how early on it is. That's crazy. It was an infrared beam that would shine at a window and then by shining back and detecting um, minute changes in brightness as the window flexed and deflected the beam a little bit, you could tell uh, basically what the sound was going on in the room. You could read the compression waves that were rattling the window just that tiny, tiny bit. That's incredible. And these still exist. They're in use. They were used, ex this one was uh, specifically called the Buran, the one that the USSR used. And it was used extensively to spy on the other embassies in Moscow, just like the bug we talked about at the top. And these are still used, like the principle works. And it got yeah. even better with lasers that are sub-visible because you're even more concentrated and you can detect those uh, things. You have a wider range that you can detect. Exactly. And again, it falls prey to the small problems of if you're not on a room with an exterior window, it doesn't work anymore. And that's what's so rough about it. The uh, original invention got the Stalin Prize, which was for the USSR, basically like a local Nobel Prize. This yeah. was the highest honor of the land of advancement for the USSR. This was a big deal. I, you know, I think Leon Theremin is the most interesting outcome of me researching this segment because I had no idea that he had done anything beyond the theremin. Right. I was already a synth nerd that like got really excited about the theremin and thought this dude was just kind of cool. Yeah. But just knowing what he contributed with espionage and what, you know, the course of history that he changed using that, it's just, it's remarkable. Absolutely. When we come back, we'll how do we get rid of bugs that we don't want? All right, we're back. So we're going to primarily be talking about uh, everyone's least favorite insect, the mosquito. Really? Yeah, because those are such a threat when it comes to like bug infestations, primarily because mosquitoes can carry malaria and we don't want malaria. Mm. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought of that. Yeah. So while my personal favorite uh, bug ex and mosquito extermination technique will always be those electric tennis rackets that you hit mosquitoes with. That my roommate insists on using every time there's a moth in the house. Poor moth. Um, but there's uh, there's been some serious development in that tech recently. So um, you might remember that TED talk a few years back about killing mosquitoes with lasers. Right. So... Um, that was, that was this guy named, uh, Nathan Mirvold, and he had prototyped a system that, uh, fires lasers at mosquitoes and it uses the, the it fires two lasers. The first detects what, uh, it, it detects motion and then it checks to see if that motion is a mosquito. 
um, because you don't want to kill bees or butterflies or moths. You want to kill mosquitoes. Right. You want the useful bugs. Yeah. And the, uh, the, the, the laser then can tell the gender and the species of the mosquito because different genders and different species of mosquitoes have different uh, like wing speeds, the right. speeds with their, the, at which their wings flap. Because male mosquitoes, um, they're mostly harmless. They don't have, uh, they can't bite like how female mosquitoes can. So um, they fire the non-lethal laser, and then they use a blue laser if the, the mosquito is female and of one of the species that can carry malaria, and then it instantly overheats the mosquito. It doesn't, like, set it on fire, which uh, it isn't as cool as it could be, but it does overheat it, and that causes its body, like, it, its wings wither immediately, and then it falls to the floor. So what you're saying is that this whole thing is a lot more metal than I was expecting, even when I heard laser bug zapper? Exactly. Um, and this original prototype that they showed off at TED, uh, one important feature is every time it zapped a mosquito, it would play the Star Wars uh, laser noise <laughs> every single time. I, You know, I, I've been over this. Even as an engineering major, I hate engineers. Me too. For the things that they're just allowed to do. <laughs> Me too. Um, this was kind of the one of the biggest products of 2010 or at least it was theorized to be however uh after the event um uh, there was a little bit of controversy so this prototype uh it had one uh well actually it had a lot of major flaws but perhaps the the biggest uh was this kind of false advertisement <clears throat> that it could just target and like shoot mosquitoes anywhere now don't get me wrong uh it could detect a mosquito detect what gender it is and then instantly vaporize it that right. technology was already there, which was really cool. But what it couldn't do was track a wide range of things. What they did in their testing is they had a little box, and they'd fill it with mosquitoes of different kinds, and then it would zap the mosquitoes they wanted to kill, and it wouldn't zap the other ones. And it could do that. But if you tried to like take it outside, uh, it didn't really have a whole lot of like range to it, which... Mm -hmm defeats the whole purpose of uh, vaporizing mosquitoes with lasers. Of a laser-based bug killer, yeah. Yeah, if it only can target this, like, box of, of, of an area, this, this tiny box, then it's not as effective as it could be. Um, so since then, they've been developing it. Uh, they got a little bit of flack, and because it's taken longer to get to the market than planned, they kind of pivoted. The original direction of the product was to stop malaria in Africa, um, however, they forgot a very key like factor of that, and that's the places in Africa that are most prevalent with malaria are going to be the places in Africa that don't have electricity. Right. right. And it's hard to power your laser uh, mosquito killer without electricity. The other issue is the original models of these things were really expensive, and it sort of makes this, it's kind of like this fence. If, if a mosquito gets in range... Once it can target an entire range, uh, then, you know, the mosquito's good. But it can't, tar it's not like a 360 degree laser. It really can just target this like wall. So with four of these, or however much you need for whatever size area you're trying to protect, you can protect it fully from mosquitoes. But if you're talking like an entire village, you'd need 30, 40, 50 of these things. Jeez, and how much... Did they ever, like, release a price? They did not, but considering that they uh, bailed entirely on deploying them in Africa, it's understandable that the cost might have been uh, higher than the cost of distributing a couple hundred thousand bug nets and mosquito nets. Right. That It does seem like it would be completely out of reach no matter what it costs. Yeah. The Bill Gates Foundation um, originally uh, was a major backer in this field because they really believed in the product. Um and while there was, I couldn't find any specifics on exactly where the funding went, it looks like they haven't gotten any new funding from them. Mm -hmm. So it looks to me like they realized that they could just save more lives with cheaper technology right now. So the laser mosquito uh, killer is still being manufactured, but now they're targeting it towards like the military and like resorts in Florida where there's still risk of malaria, but uh, you have access to electricity, the customer can potentially afford a premium for new technology like this, and then they plan to eventually get the product manufactured effectively enough to be able to deploy it in places like Africa. Right. 
Um, so there's a few other major strides in mosquito extermination. Uh, scientists have been able to manipulate the genetics of a male mosquito to create a mosquito that uh, when it breeds with a female, it renders the female infertile. Mm -hmm. So the advantage here, of course, is since female mosquitoes, for one, they're the ones that suck blood, but also if you're uh, rendering every mosquito with malaria infertile, then the next generation of, that, of the mosquito is not going to have it. Um, malaria is passed on through generations of mosquitoes, which is part of why it's so deadly. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, not always, but pretty consistently. Right. So I didn't even know that it could. Yeah. That makes it a real hazard because even if a mosquito hasn't bitten anyone with malaria in a while, it's, it, it's offspring for at least a few generations are still going to have it. Wow. I didn't um, know they were as effective. I mean, I knew they were very effective carriers, but I would have never considered that it could be a, as far as a cross generational thing. Yeah. The mutated male mosquitoes have very recently been signed into effect in the EPA, and they're starting to deploy them in parts of Florida and places like that to see if they work. Mm -hmm. And something important to uh, chime in on, um, the, I guess the reason why mosquito extermination is just so universally loved because of how much we hate mosquitoes is in most ecosystems, mosquitoes can die without any major consequences, or at least the majority of a mosquito population. Yeah, really? A lot of uh, the insects that, oh, I mean, mosquitoes, uh, they kind of like traveled and got super widespread in the same way that things like fire ants did. Um, it wasn't necessarily like these ecosystems existed prior to massive amounts of mosquitoes. And while you still need a certain amount, you don't need the overwhelming number of mosquitoes you have in, say, again, Florida. Right. It's just too many. Um. Some some more mosquito technology. Well, not just mosquitoes, but Google developed an API recently um, that exterminators can use to identify to figure out how to best combat a bug in infestation. They can take a picture of an area that has some bugs crawling around and describe what's going on, and they can instantly get results on the best way to fix it. Oh, That's not really uh, viable for consumer use because consumers don't have access to the same techniques as a bug exterminator might. Exactly, but still it like makes, having that kind of vision system, that would be a, that'd be good help. It makes things a lot easier. Um, some more neat technology. There's these vacuums mm -hmm. that you can use to uh, literally vacuum up mosquitoes. Oh. And I'm delighted to find out that these do exist outside of commercial use. Um, if, if that's a thing you can acquire, so but f commercially there's an even cooler system. Okay. And that is you, you, you have the same vacuum. You're still vacuuming up mosquitoes, but instead you deploy prime, you deploy this carbon, uh, carbon based gas that mosquitoes are attracted to. Right. And so you just get huge clumps of thousands of mosquitoes and then suck them all up in the vacuum. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Like I'd never thought of a vet. I had one of those little like roach vacuums when I was a kid that we never really used because it wasn't that effective. Yeah. But I'd never thought of that concept as something beyond like a novelty thing, like those salt guns they have for uh for the same problem. But those are novelty? Yeah, they're novelty. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> um Yeah, extermination and really like pesticides in general are really like coming a long way. I know pesticides is a little bit of a stretch from bug extermination, but they do, they accomplish the same goal. It's just, it's not an active uh, task like traditional extermination is. It's protecting the things before they get an infestation. Right. It's a preemptive thing. Yeah. Um, but before pesticides, there were actually, I mean, pesticides are a relatively recent uh, discovery if we're talking like over the course of agriculture. Mm hmm which I guess is part of why people are so iffy on uh, the long-term effects of them. But before we had pesticides, there, the old-fashioned way to prevent infestation, um, that was actually part of why crop rotation was such a common thing. We, you know how we use crop rotation to uh, like replenish the nutrients in the soil? Right. It was because you could deplete them through plants if you didn't give them yeah. the time to like re-nitrogenize the soil. Well, the same goal, like th the same thing also prevented a long-term infestation of bugs because if you had a bug that ate uh i don't know broccoli if you remove all the broccoli then that particular bug is going to die out while you're growing some other crop right it prevents infestations that last multiple generations of crops 
if your first generation of broccoli gets infested infested with bugs, then you just kind of have to deal with it. But by rotating the crops, you can still use the field and you can prevent future infestations. Something else they would do is they would plant decoy crops mm -hmm. um, just, you know, on their own little field in an attempt to try to keep the infestations localized in one area. Um, they would release bugs to kill other bugs. And by that, I mean they would find bugs that targeted and wouldn't, like, eat the plant, and they would release them to eat the bugs that were eating the plant. That seems... That seems like you have to take a very, very calculated risk with that one. Oh, yeah. It seems like it could very easily go wrong. And a lot of times it did. But as far as an early technique goes, it wasn't chemically based, and it did work pretty well. Sometimes they would just straight up deforest the area um, because a lot of bugs come from forests, things right. like ticks. If you remove the trees, if you remove their habitat, then you can grow your crops in peace. Um and a lot of people are actually starting to go back to this because we know now that pesticides, at least some pesticides, kill bees. We're developing pesticides that don't, but bees are good, and we're trying to keep those alive. So <laughs> yeah. more and more farmers are going back to the old-fashioned way of bug extermination. All right. When we come back, the bugs that exist within the computers that we use every day. Your best friend. All right, so you're going to tell us about some computer bugs, Grayson? Right. Uh, before I really get into the famous cases of the bugs that I want to cover, I want to do a little bit about the etymology. Both of you are, and I are, a, uh, I'd say we're programmers in a very loose kind of finger-waving sense of the word. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, uh, and we've both encountered our fair share, but most people never, like, question what that word bug comes from. Yeah. And it's actually from r the really, really early days of uh, actual functional computing. They would get inside vacuum tubes, right? Not vacuum tubes. Worse. Oh, no. So in the early 50s, when computers took up entire rooms, they uh, ran based on relays, electromechanical switches. So you had for everything that would be like a transistor in a modern computer or a vacuum tube in a later computer, it would be a literal mechanical switch that had to uh, flick over every time you wanted to do any sort of calculation, do anything. That's awful. So moths loved... <laughs> getting inside these switches and other bugs, and they would cause things to malfunction and short because of the moths bridging the contacts. This was also done at relatively high voltage, so it had a bad habit of killing bugs and arcing through them. Oh. So um, the early story is very kind of apocryphal. There was this naval officer, and she had a note where one was like, the bug was taped down, and I believe it said something about finding the bug that caused the malfunction. And while that's somewhat disputed by other sources it's relatively good enough yeah for our uh, for our cases the actual modern word has come under some fire for kind of uh misattributing the blame for most computer issues so people have suggested switching out the term bug for blunder to more directly blame it on programmers of course because it does seem a little bit like people are trying to push the blame off for computer issues yeah, the original bugs you'd have in computers, those weren't the programmer's fault. They would just kind of crawl in there. But hopefully that's not why you're getting your programming issues. Right, but if you just write bad code, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's where you're still going to end up with the same result. Now, these bugs, they can seem kind of, uh, you know, we're being kind of light and superfluous here, but they can uh, cause really large real-life effects. I think somewhere the estimate in, I think, 2002 by a government office was that computer issues lost us like $60 billion a year, something like that. And That's that was insane. 2002 before the huge credit card breaches and things like that started becoming a thing. Identity theft wasn't as big of an issue. And I think the most famous case of these like bugs having a real-life effect was Y2K. Of course. So you know this. For anyone that doesn't, all two of you... Um, in the early 2000s, or really in the late 90s, there became this big public fervor about this bug in computer systems. And computer systems before this, especially early on, were desperate to save every little bit of memory they could and would only encode the year as the last two digits because, well, it's 1979. You don't need more than two digits. We'll deal with that when we come to it. Yeah. And so it started becoming this thing of the public found out about it and it entered the public consciousness of, 
oh God, when the year 2000 clicks over, all of our computer systems are going to crash. Everything's going to go down. We're all going to die. Yeah. And the year 2000 was already a big target for, uh, we think the world's about to end kind of conspiracies. This only added fuel to the fire. It added almost a, a scientific or a technological aspect to people who already thought the world was going to end. They used this as kind of a, an extra argument in their arsenal. It was a much more real, like undisputable risk. The world wasn't going to end, but even the not crazy conspiracy theorists had to admit that, you know, there were many potential technical difficulties. Right. And the real problem with that was that in reality, this was a bug that had been known about since at least the early 80s and had been being patched since then. You know, when it came around, it just came and went. It was suddenly January 1st and any issues were minor. I think the biggest ones that I've heard about were like some billboards that didn't get updated and just showed dates wrong for a couple days. So it was already something, yes, it was a real problem, but it was not like this unknown problem that nobody had ever thought about. Yeah. And that was the biggest deal with it. So that was kind of a flash in the pan. These, these sorts of things aren't necessarily just flashes in the pan, though. Like I said, real world effects. Mm-hmm. The biggest one I could find and the most interesting to me as someone who is an electrical engineering major was the Northwest Blackout of 2003. Have you ever heard of this event? I haven't. So in 2003, um, a huge portion of the Northwest, Midwest, and Ontario grids, which are all interconnected, uh, went down for anywhere from two days to a week, depending on where you were in the system. And this is like this terrifying thing because, oh God, it actually did go down. It was, yeah. it actually started when um, one power plant was taken offline. This is relatively routine. Uh, this was August, right? So it was extremely hot. I think there was a heat wave at the time. So the load on the grid was unusually high and grid or power plants are designed to automatically be taken off the grid for protection. You know, yeah. the whole modern grid is based on this complex balancing act between load and supply that if you mismatch it, things go wrong. And being able to keep those voltages and things like that consistent is the work of computers. So yeah. This, was, this would not necessarily have been a huge deal had that been the only problem that happened. The big issue, though, was that a bug in the software led to this not being recognized as an overload thing that was happening. So when that grid went down, all the grid around it started changing to uh, match the load that was being bypassed around the power plant. And so you started overloading other lines. Oh, no. And things started breaking down. Lines, an actual other problem with the lines is that when power lines heat up over especially long distances, they have a, a resistance inherent in the wire. So the more current you push through them, the more voltage and load that you're pushing through a single line, the more hot it gets mm. and metal expands when it heats. So if there are overgrown trees near the transmission lines, those lines will droop down, hit those trees arc, and then that line will be taken off the system as the breakers pop. Yeah. So it causes this cascading failure because they don't know. The main grid controllers have this issue with the software that they're not even aware of. You know, their servers have gone down, things like that, but they were just assuming it was okay. I think the figure they used was normally the figures that they had to monitor the grid would refresh every two to three seconds. Mm -hmm. And during the uh, start of the cascade, it was up to every 60 seconds, but they wouldn't know that. And so by not being able to react in time and bring different power plants online, more and more power plants started going into that safety overload, take them off the grid right now system. And more and more lines started breaking off the system. And this all led to this giant cascading failure that took, I think it was around 55 million people off of power. That's over, not a small number. Over eight states and a Canadian province, which Canadian provinces are huge, if you don't know that. Ontario is, I mean, it's the size of the entire eastern United States. That's insane. Yeah. And, you know, this was all caused by one miswritten software thing. <laughs> this could all have been prevented. Or maybe not even, I would say all prevented, but this was made so much worse by an inability to react. Yeah. And this was all, it led to a lot of extra regulation. It took almost a week to bring people back online. 
Um, and this wasn't just residential, right? So when we think power outages, we think houses. The entire Manhattan island of Manhattan was off power. The entire major, major cities in the Northwest were down. And so transportation was an issue. Things like Amtrak's line that they run between D.C. and New York was offline because those are electric trains that draw power from the grid, not diesel like freight trains are. Multiple flights were grounded because you didn't have power at the airports. Cell networks went down because they ran out of generator power at the cell sites. Wow. It was this huge cascading thing. And the scariest one that I found, even scarier than all the transportation and cell stuff, was that um, over time you lose pressure in water systems. So normally these are pretty resistant to short outages. That's what water towers are for. They're to keep pressure when those pumps turn off. And residential water systems are huge, huge pressures all the time. Yeah. And the only thing keeping your water from getting like dangerous levels of bacteria and viruses is that pressure. So when that drops, they have to issue what's called a boil water advisory where you don't know if the water coming into your house is safe anymore. And it's going to take weeks to get it back up to a level where it's all purged and they can guarantee it's safe. That's terrifying. So something, yeah, something as simple as you can't trust the water coming out of your tap anymore, even if you have power back. Suddenly, something so simple as that is completely gone from your abilities to use it. Yeah. Okay. So we've been really apocalyptic so far. I'll admit, I've been like talking about these huge bugs that cause major issues. And I'll admit, I got really sidetracked in yeah. the uh, grid one when I was researching it. We can get a little bit lighter here. Okay. Um, have you ever seen those pictures of iPads and iPhones? I, I'm sure it's happened to Androids. But you know when you uh, accidentally lock yourself out of a phone and they keep doing the password code too many times? Yeah. It'll eventually say, like, locked for one minute, locked for one hour. Uh huh. And that'll just keep getting longer and longer until you can retry. Have you ever seen the picture of one where it says locked for upwards of 24 million minutes? What happened there? Yeah, those are fun. Um, basically, this all comes back to the idea that computing time is hard because time zones are terrible. I will tweet out a video of this on the show Twitter at AWDTRpod. Um, time zones are awful. And computing any sort of time or going forward and back in dates is terrible for computers. Yeah. So in the 1970s, uh, scientists working, I think, at Bell Labs, or at least on the Unix project, uh, created this thing called Epoch Time. And Epoch Time creates this number that's the amount of seconds since January 1st, 1970. And that's how computers calculate time. That's terrible. So they just have this one like billion or not billion. Uh, well, it's it's somewhere in that. This huge, huge number that is easy to translate back and forth. And this completely changes computer time. I'm not saying epoch time is bad. I like epoch time. The problem is, uh, I think it was, I can't remember if it was a bug or just some freak incident. But Apple devices could sometimes, if an update failed or if in any way the battery died, they could reset that little storage for epoch time. And so when they tried to calculate the amount of time left before you could reset the time, all they had was an end epoch and then zero. Oh. And if you plug 24 million minutes into a calculator, it's around 45 years or 48 years at this point and takes you right back to 1970. That makes sense. Right. And now this can have bigger problems than just, oh, I'm locked out of my iPhone. What do I do? It's uh, I think it was a Canadian company where their uh, point of sale systems accidentally jumped from 2010 to 2016 and started denying everyone's cards because they were expired. Ooh. That was also an epoch failure. Um, video games are also a good source of these. Have you ever heard of the or have you ever I know you've played a Civ game. Can you describe what Civ games are just? Uh, your your standard top down strategy uh, turn based game similar to Catan or Catan. Right. Have you ever played the first one? I haven't. Okay. So the first one had this bug called the nuclear Gandhi. Oh. So you could uh, interact with other societies and you could meet Mahatma Gandhi in this. But the problem was he would be extremely militaristic and violent. I remember that. So the issue was it it comes down to the way that uh, you would store dates on old or not store dates, store values, low level on computers. And this was a bigger problem on older languages. But the issue is with, depending on what kind of variable type you chose, you would get to the max value. In this case, it was 256. And if you tried to add one to it, it would wrap back to zero. So instead of going to 257, you go to zero. Okay. If you tried to go below zero, you'd wrap back to 256. 
So what happened was that Gandhi's character in the game, the violence was already so low that when they tried to take it lower, it accidentally wrapped to the highest value possible for the character. So he just got very aggressive and militaristic. Yeah, Nuclear Gandhi might be my favorite name for a computer bug. All right. <laughs> That's all we have time for this week. Thank you for listening to Are We Doing This Right on WEGL 91.1. You can find us on Twitter at AWDTRpod. That's AWDTR as in Are We Doing This Right. We post notifications of when we're going live and also video recordings of the show. I'm Grayson. I'm Ezra. And thank you for listening.